Welcome to Trinity Community Church on a cold and snowy morning. Thank you for coming out today. Um, a few notices before we begin. First, a, a sad notice. Elsie Ewing, who was a member of Pennycook South and Howgate, died on 18th July 2020, when numbers attending funerals were very restricted. And a short service of interment of her ashes will take place at 11.30 on Monday, that's the 12th of December, in Kirkhill Cemetery. Now, my next notice says carols on the green. Uh, it will happen, but it won't be on the green, because nothing is green around here anymore. Um, so it's from 2 till 4 p.m. at Foster Road, and you don't have to stay for the entire time. Uh, but please come and sing carols and have hot drinks and refreshments and mince pies and all that stuff, uh, and hopefully we'll have a good time. And all the time when we've had anything happening on the green, We've had good conversations with people. And so that I hope that will happen today as well. There's a prayer meeting this evening in the church hall at 7.15 p.m. for around an hour. And there's two other chances to sing carols. There's carol singing in the precinct on Saturday 17th December from 10 until noon and carols on Howgate Village Green with Forest Church on Sunday the 18th of December at 5.30 p.m. Let's pause for a moment as we come to worship God. Let's worship God. We sing our first song, we wait with great expectancy, and it goes to the tune of God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen. Just before we come together in prayer, uh, a notice which I forgot to give. Um, 
you'll see we have two cribs, one at the front and one at the side. The one at the side was a gift from Margaret and Rob McGregor to Glenn Korskirk. Um, and I have to say, it's very fragile. So while it's beautiful to look at, and we invite you to look at it, please don't touch it. <laughs> That's only the, the only teacherly thing I'm going to say today. Um, let's pray. God our Father, in Jesus Christ, you came to our world so quietly, to the little town of Bethlehem, and you were laid in a manger by a young girl. And your coming was first witnessed by shepherds who'd been out working in the fields. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so our ways are not your ways, nor our thoughts your thoughts. Time and again you've chosen the humble and the insignificant and you've worked out your purposes through them. You've counted those who will listen and obey, who humbly accept your word planted in them as more important than the world's rulers. You've shown your strength in what the world counts as weakness, You've made the last first and the least the greatest. Father, teach us afresh today to humble ourselves under your mighty hand that you may exalt us in due time. Teach us to cast all our cares, our worries and anxieties on you because we trust that you care about us. Teach us to confess our sins to you in real penitence and faith so that we may receive forgiveness from you and serve you in holiness and righteousness all our days. We take the chance to do so silently now confessing anything that weighs on our conscience or troubles our mind to you, our God. Father, we thank you that your promise of forgiveness in Jesus still stands and is available to all who will come humbly and confess their sins to you. Help us to feel confident before you, not because of our own resourcefulness and wisdom, but because of our own achievements or self-regard, but because you loved us and sent Jesus to us to give his life for us and to be our saviour. And because you make us able to do what you ask us to do through your spirit at work in us and in our fellow creatures in answer to our prayers. Amen. I wonder, what reminds you that Christmas is on the way? Well, put your hands up. Did you say the television adverts? Yeah. Yeah, it's become almost an annual thing that we look forward to seeing the John Lewis advert to see what they'll think of these days. Uh, Joan? Uh, hearing Christmas carols. Um, Christmas carols. What else? Lights everywhere. School's chaos. Yes, and, and there's also chaos in the supermarket because you know that time when they, they change all the aisles around at Tesco's and you can't find where they've put the kitchen rolls. That's always a sign that Christmas is coming. 
And another, another thing. Well, I'll tell you one. When they start playing Christmas songs in the shops, you know that Christmas is coming. Now, these are, are quite secular signs. Has anyone got a favorite Christmas song, by the way? And it's okay, you're allowed to say a secular one <laughs> as well as a, as a song that we sing in church. In the bleak midwinter. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Oh, what a glorious night. Oh, holy night. Sorry, I... Do they know it's Christmas? I didn't hear you, Liz. The Christmas alphabet. Ooh, that's a new one on me, so you'll have to share it afterwards. You know, in Luke's gospel, at the beginning, we come across four songs. They're hymns of praise to God, and they're all dispersed around the stories of Jesus' birth. They're four songs that bring you to the heart of Christmas. That's as Alistair Begg puts it in his, his book of the same name. He calls it a Christmas playlist. Four songs that bring you to the heart of Christmas. And they are, no, I won't ask you. They are Mary's song. Zechariah's song. The song of the angels outside Bethlehem. And finally, the song of Simeon in the temple. And we're going to look at these four songs over the Christmas period, or Advent and leading up to Christmas. But before that, we're going to hear another song or poem. Someone's going to come up and read it to us, Ian, I believe, that comes from the time maybe when Israel or Judah got to their lowest point during the Babylonian invasion or in the aftermath of it. Because Psalm 74 is a lament for all that Judah has lost in the destruction caused by Babylon. The temple was left in ruins. This was the place where God said he would place his name and it was gone. The line of kings descended from David was ended and God had promised David that his dynasty would last forever. How would God be able to keep that promise? And the land itself, which God had promised to Abraham, was now depopulated and the people taken into exile, with only some of the people left behind to tend the land. These three signs of God's goodness had gone. But God is still good. God was still good. And Psalm 74, as well as being a psalm of lament, is also a psalm of personal faith in the God who always keeps his promise. Even when everything seems against it. And the poet says in it, we are given no signs from God, no prophets are left, and none of us knows how long this will be. But God is my king from long ago. He brings salvation on the earth. Ian, if you would read the psalm, please. Psalm 74. O God, why have you rejected us forever? 
Why does your anger smolder against the sheep of your pasture? Remember the nation you purchased long ago, the people of your inheritance whom you redeemed, Mount Zion where you dwell. Turn your steps towards these everlasting ruins, all this destruction the enemy has brought on earth on the sanctuary. Your foes rode in the place where you met with us. They set up their standards as signs. They behaved like men wielding axes to cut through a thicket of trees. They smashed all the carved panelling with their axes and hatchets. They burned your sanctuary to the ground. They defiled the dwelling place of your name. They said in their hearts, we will crush them completely. They burned every place where God was worshipped in the land. We are given no signs from God. No prophets are left. And none of us knows how long this will be. But God is my king from long ago. He brings salvation on the earth. The day is yours and yours also the night. You established the sun and moon. It was you who set all the boundaries of the earth. You made both summer and winter. Remember how the enemy has mocked you, Lord. How foolish people have reviled your name. Do not hand over the life of your dove to wild beasts. Do not forget the lives of your afflicted people forever. Have regard for your covenant, because haunts of violence fill the dark places of the land. Do not let the oppressed retreat in disgrace. May the poor and needy praise your name. Amen. Now we're going to sing the song which we heard at the beginning. Lord, turn your footsteps towards these ruins. We need you here. We need you here. The second reading today is from Luke chapter 1 and reading verses 39 to 56. Mary got up and went quickly to a town in the hill country of Judea. She went into Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the unborn baby inside her jumped and she was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she said to Mary, God has blessed you more than any other woman and God has blessed the baby you will have. You are the mother of my Lord and you have come to me. Why has something so good happened to me? When I heard your voice, the baby inside me jumped with joy. Great blessings are yours because you believed what the Lord said to you. You believed this would happen. Then Mary said, I praise the Lord with all my heart. I am very happy because God is my saviour. I'm not important, but he has shown his care for me, his lowly servant. From now until the end of time, people will remember how much God blessed me. Yes, the powerful one has done great things for me. His name is very holy. He always gives mercy to those who worship him. He reached out his arm and showed his power. He scattered those who are proud and think great things about themselves. He brought down rulers from their thrones and raised up humble people. He filled the hungry with good things, but he sent the rich away with nothing. God has helped Israel, the people he chose to serve him. He did not forget his promise to give us his mercy. He has done what he promised to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then went home. Amen. May God add his blessing to these readings from his holy word. Let's pray. Father, please send your Holy Spirit on me as I speak and on the rest of us as we listen and think about these things, about Mary's song. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
you remember way back in March when the Reverend John Young came and spoke at the KIPP service? Something he said then, how he often asks those who say that they don't believe in God, tell me about the God that you don't believe in. And that, he said, often leads to deep conversations about someone's personal history and why they have been turned off by their idea of God. It's a good question to ask people in evangelism. It's a good question to ask yourself as well. What words come to mind when I think about God? Is God distant, unconcerned, or is he harsh and unloving? Or maybe God doesn't make a ripple on your mind at all. Today I want to talk about the, the God that Mary believed in. What is the picture of God in Mary's song? You may be familiar with the background of the story already. A heavenly messenger has been sent by God to a teenage girl in Nazareth, Mary, who's engaged to be married to Joseph, who's descended from the ancient King David, but lives an ordinary life as a builder and joiner. And the messenger tells her that she's going to conceive and bear a son who will be called the Son of God Most High. He's going to be a king like his illustrious ancestor and his kingship will last forever. And something in the immediacy of the angel's words surprises Mary. He's obviously not talking about the ordinary way of having children. But how can this be? She's a virgin. And the angel says that this will happen by God's power. He tells us, or he tells her, that her relative Elizabeth is also going to have a baby, though she's well past childbearing age. So Mary goes on a long journey of some 80 miles to see Elizabeth. It's presumably to find someone sympathetic and faithful who will understand what Mary is going through, who's had a similar experience, and maybe will be able to impart some words of wisdom to her. Elizabeth, on seeing her, speaks words inspired by the Holy Spirit. She calls Mary the mother of my Lord, and Mary responds in praise with Mary's song. Now, I think a word of explanation is necessary here because people generally don't speak in verse. And I think Luke or someone or even Mary herself have gathered these thoughts together, which she probably said at the time, because they're, they're thoughts that come from the Old Testament, which Mary would have heard in the synagogue week by week. And Luke has gathered up these songs, which reflect the faith of Israel. They're not Christianized songs. They reflect the faith of Israel at that time. And that's where we find them. Luke is acting like a Greek historian. And Greek historians normally reconstructed speeches long after they'd been made. And Luke probably got it from eyewitnesses, perhaps from Mary herself. And Mary's song 
speaks about a God who cares. Mary says, I'm not important, but God has shown his care for me, his lowly servant. God pays special attention to her, even though in the eyes of the world, she's just another young girl who's easily ignored by people who think themselves more important. You know, it's the same Greek word that James in his letter, James, the brother of Jesus, he uses negatively to describe how some people in the church pay special attention to some people and not to others. He says, my dear friend, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, never think that some people are more important than others. Suppose someone comes into your church meeting wearing fine clothes and a gold ring, and at the same time a poor person comes in wearing old worn out clothes. And you pay special attention to the one wearing fine clothes and say, please sit here in this good seat. But you say to the poor person, stand over there or, or sit on the floor by my feet. What are you doing? You're making some people more important than others. And with evil thoughts, you're deciding that one person is better. Now, I hope you can see although they're using the same word, the same Greek word, how what Mary is talking about is different from what James is talking about. In James, people are putting the limits of their own prejudices on God's regard for people. But for Mary, it's working the other way. God's favor extends to the least and the lowest. The attention that God shows to her is not simply for her. It's for all her people. God cares for his people. God has helped Israel, she says, the people he chose to serve him, and he didn't forget his promise to give us his mercy. He has done what he promised to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Here is a whole nation and a whole history that God remembers in mercy. And God's promise to Abraham is this. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and I will place a curse on those who harm you and all the people on earth will be blessed through you. And through good times and bad, through the times when the people have been faithful to God and the times when most of them have not been faithful, God has been shaping his people for a special purpose. And although we have to wait for the fourth song by Simeon till we get a hint of what God's plan was all along, that Mary's child, Jesus, will be a light to reveal your will to the Gentiles and to bring glory to your people Israel. God wants to show what he's like to everyone in the world, 
and to give each of them a chance to turn from their own way and to experience God's forgiveness and new life. God cares about the world. But Mary doesn't just speak about God's care for people. She speaks about God as having great power. She says, yes, the powerful one has done great things for me. He reached out his arm and showed his power. He scattered those who are proud and think great things about themselves. He brought down rulers from their thrones and raised up humble people. He filled the hungry with good things, but he sent the rich away with nothing. Now maybe some of you are thinking that this is a contradiction of what I said earlier, that God cares and is interested in all people. What do we mean by saying that God scatters those who are proud and he sends the rich away with nothing? God doesn't do this out of spite or vindictiveness. God isn't like human beings in their motives. God does it for a purpose that people might be delivered from self-sufficiency and from every proud assumption that people trust in rather than God. It's easy to say when we're comfortable, we can buy all this. We achieve, we can achieve all that we need. We don't need God. But the truth is that we do. Let's go back to James again where he says, quoting Proverbs, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And James reminds us that God loves to give grace and more grace. God doesn't turn us away. But sometimes God has to make the way clear for us to seek him. And he does that by resisting the proud. Scattering the proud in the imagination of their hearts. And sending the rich away with nothing. I like many of you. And certainly many others and certainly some of you have been reading through the book of the prophet Jeremiah. And it's a hard read at times. It's hard going because of Jeremiah's hard message and also because of the stubbornness of those people in power. It's, it's like he comes against them again and again and they, they say, no, 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 we don't want to listen to that. Not to mention the way that the book is constructed. And because of Judah's unfaithfulness, because of their idolatry, because of their social sins, they're being sent into exile. And the destruction that we read about in Psalm 74 comes about. But then in chapter 46 of Jeremiah, something of God's purpose in this is revealed. Don't be afraid, Jacob, my servant. Don't be dismayed, Israel. I will surely save you out of a distant place. Your descendants from the land of their exile. Jacob will again have peace and security and no one will make him afraid. Don't be afraid, Jacob, my servant, for I am with you, declares the Lord. 
Though I completely destroy all the nations among which I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. And the prophet is, is using hyperbole there. I will discipline you, but only in due measure I will not let you go entirely unpunished. God's purpose is good. God cares about us. God pays close attention to what we do, both the good and the bad. And God has acted powerfully in history. All this Mary's song says. It's good to remember that as we come on, as we come into Christmas time again. Let's pray. Father, we're reminded of the strange way that you brought Israel, how you knocked down all these signs of your faithfulness in the past so that you could rebuild a nation according to your eternal purpose. An eternal purpose which we see fulfilled in Jesus, who came for the salvation of people all around the earth. Help us to take Mary's example and trust in you and trust in him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to sing a, a song which is a version of uh, Mary's song, Tell Out My Soul, The Greatness of the Lord. Now we come to the lighting of... Um, the third Advent candle. I say we come from it. I was saying it's sometimes it takes a bit longer than we anticipate. Especially it might. Oh. Oh. <laughs> now, does someone want to come out? And light the, if you light three candles. Thank you, Vicky. This is what the book of the prophet Isaiah says in chapter 61. It's a, a prophecy of the Messiah who was anointed by God. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to sing the song Comfort and Joy. And if you just remain seated to sing, because these words are, are really profound. Let's pray together. Father God, everything good that we have comes from you. In the offerings that we've brought, we're only giving back a small part of what is already yours. But we pray that you will use them to fulfil your purposes, to bring all your children into a living and loving relationship with you. Almighty and eternal God, we bow down and worship you 
as the creator of the universe, the infinite and all-powerful one who has made everything and everybody as there ever has been and ever will be. But we also thank you from the bottom of our hearts that you are our Father, the God of grace, and that you want to pour out your love onto us, your children. So this morning we bring to you some people who are struggling or are in bad situations and who need the help that only you can provide. As we get into winter, and at a time when more and more people are finding it impossible to heat their houses adequately, we pray that here in Pennycook and in every community, there will be provision for people to spend their days in a warm environment. We thank you for the arrangements that have already been made, and we ask that these will be well publicised, and that no one who needs this provision will hesitate because of what they think other people might think. We're conscious too that unprecedented numbers of people are finding it difficult or impossible to feed themselves or their families. We thank you for the many food banks that are trying to alleviate these situations, including FFF and the food store, and we pray that they will always have the resources to meet all the needs that come their way. Lord, the needs that people have in this country are real and urgent. But we also need to recognise the much more desperate situation others are in, especially those affected by war. Whether it's Ukraine, Syria, Myanmar or anywhere else, it must seem like a never-ending nightmare with no hope to hold on to. Father God, we pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you will bring these wars to an end and establish a true peace where people who were once enemies can live safely side by side. And Lord, we pray too for ourselves. You have told us that above all else we are to love you and to love our neighbour as much as we love ourselves. We can't do that on our own. But with your help we can. So we ask you to help us to put aside our selfish natures so that we can pass on the love that we have received from you to others who need it just as much. Lord, please show each of us who our neighbours are and fill us with the love that you want us to pass on to them. And finally, Father God, we pray together the prayer the Lord Jesus taught his first disciples and which he also wants us to make our own. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're now going to sing, which I must admit is one of my favourite Christmas songs, Of the Father's Love Begotten, and you'll need a, a big breath for this because it's six stanzas.
And now may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.